And I will what? do this. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to the second live Q&A with John McIntosh. I'm so happy you're here. My name is Ann Carey Ford, and I'm the moderator and co-host of this Q&A. We've entitled it, What's Really Going On? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, about the great shift, which is the time that we're in right now. Um, before we get started, I just want to mention that this we're going to try to keep this at 55 minutes long. This is actually our second Q&A. So if you wanted to watch the first one, you would go to John's YouTube channel. I think he's going to pop up that banner right now. Love Lines WG on YouTube. And you can watch that in the replay. Also, if you have comments or questions as we go along today, please put them in the live comments section on your screen. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. So before I bring on John, I just want to introduce myself. As I said, my name is Ann Carey Ford. I live in Southern California. and. Um, I've also been exploring the shift um, pretty much since January of last year. I started to get downloads, messages about it. And so I was prompted to put my insights out on a platform. So I, I launched a website, which launched last Easter. And the name of the website is voiceofdivinefeminine.com. So you can reach out to me there. I'd love to get your feedback or your, your thoughts about the content there. And um, you can contact me through the website. So I think probably all of you are familiar with John's um, history, who he is. Uh, but for those who may not be familiar, I'm just gonna read a super quick little bio about John. John McIntosh was a successful entrepreneur until 1999. He traveled for decades around the world, speaking to tens of thousands of people about personal development before leaving everything behind and diving into self-discovery inquiry. John shares his acquired understanding of the false self-identity together with his personal experience of thinking with the heart which returns you to full consciousness of who you really are through his 27 books and his daily blog article. So he's just popped up a link where you can find some of his books and um, you can certainly get that link in the replay, which will be on his YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring on John McIntosh to say a few words before we jump into the questions. There he is, hi John. Thank you so much, uh, Anne. I really uh, appreciate your uh, working uh, behind the scenes, uh, taking care of all the heavy lifting for me. Um, today, um, we should say that uh, we don't have any live guests, although we do have some questions from, actually they are live, so <laughs> uh, they were live anyway when they sent their, their questions in, uh, but they're not actually uh, on the broadcast today. So um, Anne will be asking the questions uh, for them, um, and as I said, we're to, uh, as she, Anne said, we'll keep it to about 55 minutes, which seems to be uh, the most uh, popular length of time that uh, occurs uh, on YouTube replays. So uh, before we get into the questions, um, uh, just uh, continuing on with the uh, what's really going on, what's really happening theme, uh, which you could say is a subheading for the great shift that's now occurring, uh, let me reiterate a little bit of what I said uh, last week um, uh, as a preamble to uh, what I want to talk about today, um, which is also a preamble to the questions, uh, having to do with um, what I call the three levels of awakening uh, that are going on right now. Um, I mentioned last week that uh, within the dream, within the grand dream, within the universe or universes, um, uh, that is a, uh, all of it is a dream. Anything that has a beginning and an ending is a dream. Uh, there is a, um, a grand shift going on, which is part of a 26,000 year cycle 
um, uh, of which uh, we are now moving into a neutral phase coming out of the dysfunctional divine masculine patriarchy. A few years ago, you could arguably say 2012 is when we uh, entered it completely, and, and we're interfacing it more and more each day as the dysfunctional patriarchy collapses everywhere, and this is very easy to see. And the divine feminine is uh, expanding, not to overtake the divine masculine, but to become balanced with it in the neutral phase, which is about 2,000 years. So in that phase, you could call it the age of light, um, uh, many things occur, one of which is um, the what I call the little awakening. And the little awakening is a phase where <clears throat> the, the, the mass of humanity, which has been deeply sleeping, you could say in a hypnosis, um, uh, starts to become aware that the life that they've been living um, is not real. And now this is not total awakening. This is awareness that you could say the wool has been pulled over their eyes. There really is only one, but let's just talk about humanity as if it is more than one. Uh, and and that the, the story the storyline of the dream, which is like a movie or, or a stage play, um, has not been uh, true. And if you look at what's gone on since the Internet, to 1995, somewhere in there, uh, certainly explosive in the last 10 years, uh, the availability of instant communication, literally instant anywhere around the world, which means the exposure of what's going on instantly and the inability to hide things that used to be relatively easy to hide. People take their cell phones out and they record things that are happening as they happen. This combined with, um, some people will call it uh, the elite, they'll call it the deep state, um, has been functional for perhaps 250 years, where there's been an attempt uh, by other sleepers, a group of other sleepers, a very small group, to bring about a one world order. Now, if you look at that uh, indifferently, uh, without any judgment, uh, that would seem to be a good thing. Uh, you could also say that um, uh, sex is a way of attempting to reunite with God. So this attempt by this small group of people, which is part of a dream, remember this is not real, but it's part of a dream that has been unfolding, um, has been controlling basically what humanity thinks is true uh, for about 250 years. And, and certainly in a very large way um, in the last 25 uh, to 50 years. However, what's happening, and you could, you could also say that this current pandemic and the situation with the uh, uh, black rights, um, the situation with uh, economies falling, even disasters such as 9-11, um, various other things that you can, you can look at as possibilities of this scenario have been going on as, as a way of controlling humanity and bringing them to this one world uh, government, one world control, one world consciousness, you could say. You could say almost that the, the um, uh, intention behind this was altruistic. That doesn't mean that it was, and it doesn't mean that it is. Uh, but you could say that the predilection within the heart of, of this group, remember this is still a dream, uh, was to bring about a one world situation. And, and this is where it resonates with truth, although it's dysfunctional because it's part of the grand dream. And the grand dream is founded on the belief in separation. And separation is always dysfunctional. The entire universe is always functioning on a dysfunctional platform based on separation, which brings about conflict, chaos, and confusion. It's part of the way that the God that you are, that I am, that everyone is, tastes contrast. So this is what's occurring right now. And, and I call this the little awakening as millions, perhaps hundreds of millions, are coming to an awareness that something about this picture is not right, uh, that something's going on that may not be true. Maybe many things are going on that aren't true. Well, e even if the truth was brought out, it's still not the truth because it's part of the dream, but it's a beginning. 
it's a beginning where there's some head scratching going on. And this um, a concept, if you may have heard about it, called cognitive dissonance. I'm probably mispronouncing that. It's, it's like the difficulty of consciousness to accept something which is way beyond the belief system that you perhaps had since, since you were born. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very difficult to break through this unless there are a lot of shock, shocking things that happen that, that bring you to a point where you start to scratch your head and say, well, maybe what I've been believing isn't true. And, um, and I should start researching. Okay. So this is a first step um, of a, of a major shift that's going on at the same time, simultaneously, where people question the dream. They don't know they're dreaming yet. They, they just think, uh, this is a uh, reality, uh, but it's not really the way I thought it was. Some of those people, a percentage of those people reach a point where they're so dissatisfied, so dissatisfied with the dream that they now recognize as dysfunctional. Uh, that they can't take it anymore, um, and they want to, um, they could say, uh, find a better way. Uh, this is where you find many uh, spiritually oriented people from basic religion to the various uh, forms of uh, spirituality, of which there are hundreds. And uh, there's a kind of a question mark here as to how real it is, because what's really happening is people are trying to dance at two weddings. What they're really trying to do is make the dream that they may or may not yet know is a dream or believe is a dream. It's very intellectual. It's not in the heart yet. They want to make it more comfortable. Um, so all of the food, clothing, and shelter and all of the extra things that go on beyond that, they want to increase to the point where, where life is more comfortable through spirituality. And this is where the vast majority of spiritual people are at some point. Then uh, a percentage of those people, and all of these, these percentages are increasing exponentially as the, the light expands. It really doesn't expand. The awareness of the light expands. Light doesn't change. The self doesn't change. God doesn't change. The awareness of it changes. So the awareness of the light that we are is expanding as we move into this neutral phase, the age of light. And so there are an, a percentage, and it's a growing number, that are saying, I choose freedom. This is my words. This is what I chose in 1999 when I jumped off the cliff of, of um, uh, the, the dream into self-inquiry uh, and freedom. Um, it was, is, for those people, a no matter what, and I always put this in large print, uh, a no matter what choice to be free. And no matter what means no matter what, right to the death if necessary, but uh, it can also mean uh, giving up everything. In my case, that was necessary, but it's not usually that. It's usually the willingness to give up whatever is necessary to give up to uh, bring your conscious awareness to the freedom of the God that you are, consciousness or I am, or the self in large print that you are, to bring yourself to freedom. You can call freedom love, you can call it beauty, you can call it abundance, you can call it peace, um, you can call it beauty, um, not in so far as the mind thinks of these things, but in so far as the unconditional, which means unconditioned, having no conditions, um, so-called interpretation of what those things really mean, which is vastly uh, different than what the mind can conceive of, no matter how beautiful. So this is what's happening right now, and, and it may be that's why I was pulled to start these broadcasts to uh, perhaps be of some uh, service in, in helping those that are making these shifts, whether it's the, the little um, uh, awakening or the, the next phase uh, of awakening or the real awakening to the self, to the God that you really are. And, um, and I encourage you to, to share your, your comments and share your questions. Um, in these broadcasts or uh, separately through the email that uh, that we uh, posted before, um, if I can uh, find it. Um, I encourage you to send these in, whether you can attend the show or not uh, as a guest, um, send them in so that uh, we can share them with, with everyone. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, go back to um, my uh, 
really the star of the show, uh, who <laughs> is going to, if I can figure out how to get her back. There she is. <laughs> there we go. She's <laughs> around here is, somewhere. Who's going to Anne, who's going to ask the uh, first question. I'm just going to okay. take a sip of water here. Cool. Well, the first question that was submitted that is by Sherry, and this is Sherry's question. Within the last several months, I've experienced heart openings, feeling an abundance of love for all things, and three days at zero point. Now I'm back to working through density. I thought I'd already let go. Have I done something wrong, or is this normal transitioning through the levels of awakening? This is a, uh, an extremely important question that I'm going to answer. <laughs> Here we go. Um, it's asked quite frequently in different ways. And um, uh, it's very, very common uh, for people that are um, deeply involved uh, in, let, let's, let's call it working on themselves. But um, uh, one explanation is uh, interpretation of satsang is standing in the fire of who you are not. Um, in order for the truth to be revealed. It's like um, uh, who you are not are like clouds uh, hiding the sun. And um, uh, clearing of the clouds, which is conditioning, which is attachments, expectations, identifications tied to memory and imagination. That makes up the false self personality, person uh, that most people believe they are. So those are clouds that hide the real you, which I call the slumbering God self. It's the self that's cloaked, really cloaked, you could say almost in armor, um, from uh, who it really is. And so it, it comes to a state of hypnosis where it believes this is who I am. And so it acts like a person. Um, and, and then all of the foibles that, that go with this idea of I am an individual, I am a person, I'm one of um, seven and a half, eight billion people. Uh, and, you know, I live here. I do this. I do that. Here's my history. Um, here's my resume. Um, here's what I'm doing with my life. And, and this becomes the reality for the vast majority of humanity. As I said before, this is changing very, very quickly. So um, what happens when someone has made this no matter what choice uh, to be free? which I'm uh, sensing uh, Sherry has done, uh, is there are moments when there are cracks in the armor, a chink in the armor of this conditioning where the light of truth penetrates the chink in the armor. And you could say it's like kissing the sleeping beauty that it really is, which is the sleeping or slumbering God self. And in that moment, there's a kind of a yawn, um, Sleeping Beauty yawns. And, uh, and you know that feeling when you're just waking up in the morning and you're sort of half there and you're half not there. It's actually quite a euphoric state usually. Uh, and you don't really want to wake up uh, and yet you, you either uh, will or you have to, you feel you have to, uh, or you do. Uh, in that moment, uh, there is a kind of awareness that what you're waking up to is not true. It's not real. And uh, that can remain with you as long as you stay in that euphoric state, which is usually not terribly long, especially if you use a, a um, alarm clock. So then there can be a phase, let's call it clock time, can be a phase of perhaps a few days. There have been people that have gone through this for years. Uh, but let's say that it, it lasts for certainly hours, uh, if not for days, uh, without dissipating. And um, you're kind of floating in a euphoric state. You're going through your, your motions of, you know, getting dressed and washing and eating and poss possibly going to work, uh, doing whatever you do. But you're, you're floating. And it feels like you have, quote unquote, arrived. Um, what this really is, is a layer of conditioning, like a cloud, a hole has been punched in a cloud of conditioning. Remember attachments, expectations, and identifications. A hole has been punched in this, and you're seeing clearly for that moment, whatever that moment is in clock time. And uh, it's 
it truly is euphoric, uh, even blissful. And then um, it ends. And you feel like, as uh, Thierry has said, I've done something wrong. Well, no, you haven't. Uh, it's just that layer has dissolved um, in the fire of who you're not because you stood in it in whatever way you chose, whatever modality, whatever practice, whatever discipline you're involved in. And now other layers, just like clouds moving in the sky, cover the sun again. This you could also call an aha or a satori, um, an epiphany. Um, and one of those very, very rarely wakes a person up, the so-called person, wakes the slumbering God self up completely. <clears throat> it has been known to happen, but they've done enormous amounts of work on themselves in other lifetimes. Other lifetimes are also dreams. It's just a dream within the dream. But they've done a lot of work on themselves, and they're now ready. Uh, they may have, for example, uh, sat uh, with a, a so-called master or sage, such as Ramana, and in silence, and, and in that silence had an epiphany, and that was enough for them, and they were free. Um, this is extremely rare. For most people, it's this uh, tissue paper has been pulled away, burned down, and, uh, and now another one, several other parts of the conditioning has arisen. Um, and this goes on and on and on. You can have hundreds of epiphanies, hundreds of ahas or satoris before um, you are completely free. And I used the analogy last week of sitting, let's say, in the front row of a, of a theater, live theater, watching yourself on the stage tethered to the player, the person, the body on the stage, body, mind, identity, but knowing that you're not it. And yet having still a lot of baggage, which is the conditioning, uh, holding you. And so this continues to try to pull you back onto the stage. This is exactly what's happening when someone has this moment and then returns back to uh, the stage again. Um, and then gradually, as these tissue paper moments of conditioning burn away, you, you move higher into the audience. And as I said before, um, this is reducing the baggage to what I call an echo. It's like you're halfway up the amphitheater. And then ultimately, as you continue that, and it becomes much easier. Actually, it's more difficult because you're more sensitive. It's like a, a snake without a skin. Uh, you're more sensitive, but it's much more quick. Uh, you move very, very quickly when it's echoes up, up into the top of the theater, which you could call whispers. It's just a, a whiff of conditioning still remains. And in those cases, there usually is no head scratching. You, you know that, uh, that the remnants of who you are not um, are dying quickly, being burned away quickly. Uh, and you see yourself usually pretty much consistently as the self. But still, in the, you, could, you could say, as Jesus said, in the dream, but not of the dream. Navigating the dream, but not of it. And when you're navigating the, the, the dream, but you're not of it, you see the beauty that exists underneath the dream, no matter how dysfunctional, and it's very dysfunctional in some places, um, no matter how dysfunctional it is, you can feel the beauty, call it love, uh, that really is uh, the dream. And the dream is the cloak that the self wears, either in sleep or not in sleep, um, as the conditioning is gone. So I hope that helps, Sherry. And I'll just uh, bring back... Uh, my oh, that, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Dustin in the UK. Uh, he actually asked a little smattering of questions, but I chose one that I thought was pertinent. Uh, he says, if our unique conditioning manifests the experience, the experiences that we have in the world of dreams, I don't quite understand why you wouldn't want to change that conditioning for it to be as positive as possible. You suggested that purifying karma and conditioning is pointless or not even possible. Can you explain a bit more? Yeah, that's, um, that's a, uh, an extremely good uh, question that I'm sure uh, many people have asked uh, either very consciously or, or subconsciously 
if such a thing actually existed. Um, why not? Why not get rid of? Why not? Why not fix the condition if you know it's there? Um, some people will say, well, why not? Uh, why not do a bunch of uh, good karma? You hear this all the time: good karma to cancel out the bad karma. Um, these kinds of ideas have been heavily promoted for thousands of years by a number of different spiritual traditions, and they were absolutely fine explanations, suggestions, even lifelong practices during the heavier period when the, the divine masculine uh, was dominating um, the globe, dominating the dream. Uh, it made a lot of sense. But now that we're moving into what I like to consider a very clear and simple phase, uh, where simple answers and simple explanations um, can be um, taken in by many people. I don't mean they're taken in. I mean, I mean they can absorb uh, simplicity easier than they could have in the past because the, the, the uh, false self, which some people call the ego, I never use that term because there's so many connotations. Um, uh, I call it the false self. Uh, it loves complicated. It loves analysis. It loves figuring out. Uh, and this is why um, education is so sought after. Um, first of all, when the sleeping self is completely asleep, and then even education within the spiritual community, um, uh, spiritual books, uh, spiritual practices, spiritual belief systems is sought after. I read everything, studied everything. Uh, I can't remember any of it now, um, except if it needs to be remembered. You have to let it all go. You have to be empty. Let everything go um, when you when you step into the arms of the real self that you are. You cannot come carrying everything. What's what's full has to be empty before the light can shine on it. So ultimately, uh, all of this knowledge, uh, which is head knowledge, um, acquired factual knowledge, all of this has to eventually has to be let go completely. Uh, when you're ready. Um, and that's why simplicity um, is um, the way, the quickest way, the direct way, the direct route um, to uh, the awareness of the God that you are. So then let's just look at karma. What is karma? Well, karma is another, and it's also a dream, uh, as is reincarnation. They're real within the dream, but they're not real, really real. Uh, they are instruments uh, like this this 26,000 year cycle uh, that we're going through uh, into the neutral phase. That's also a dream, but it's a tool. Karma is a tool uh, within the dream. And it's another word for what I call conditioning because karma has many uh, connotations as well. Uh, conditioning is very simple. It's what you're attached to, uh, the expectations that you have in life, and there are thousands, mostly unknown, uh, un, uh, consciously unknown, um, the things that you identify with, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm a male or a female, I'm, I'm a, a black, white, uh, uh, yellow, green, uh, I'm, uh, I'm all these different things, uh, I live at this address and so on. Um, identifications tied to memory, which is the past, and imagination, which is the future. Uh, this is conditioning, this is karma. And it's like a merry-go-round that it seems like you, you meaning the so-called individual, although there is only just one of us here, um, uh, is stuck on, this merry-go-round you're stuck on and can't get off. Not true at all. That's just a belief. And uh, as long as it's a belief, it remains part of your reality. Uh, so there are some beliefs that have said that uh, your karma takes millions of years to sort out. Um, and that they give you practices for it. And, and uh, if someone buys into this, then they definitely are not feeling or thinking that uh, I could be free in this lifetime or I could attain uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, enlightenment, uh, self-realization, uh, God consciousness, Christ consciousness, uh, Brahman, whatever you want to call it, I can't attain that in this lifetime. I've got many lifetimes to go through before I can get rid of this karma. Quite frankly, this is nonsense. Uh, but it's nonsense that made sense for a while, uh, but it doesn't any longer. It's not necessary. Your conditioning that makes up who you have believed you are 
I say have because in this moment that can be let go of. Uh, this conditioning can be dissolved totally in a moment. But more specifically, it can be, and I, I've used this word baggage, can be placed in a bag while you are off the stage, while you're free. You cannot, you cannot resolve the karma, the conditioning. You can't fix it because it's not real. It's it's you just like you can't grasp a cloud that's hiding the sun. It's not real. So you can't fix what isn't real. This is why all attempts to fix the dysfunctional world uh, is a dog chasing its tail. You can you can you can fix the scenario, the story, the drama that's happening could be a major one, um, you know, like uh, like uh, cleaning up the earth. But the energy of the conditioning that made this scenario of dysfunction occur is still there. And it will manifest somewhere else, possibly totally differently than the um, earth that has been poisoned, let's say. It'll manifest that same energy somewhere else because it has to be dissolved. And you cannot dissolve it because it's not real, which is a kind of a catch-22. What you can do is you can step off the merry-go-round of conditioning, the simplest and most direct way is through self-inquiry. And I'll just reiterate that very quickly again. What is self-inquiry is when an issue comes up, let's say you're angry at the way the world's being um, poisoned, uh, maybe furious, maybe you're in a constant state of rage, or you're mildly angry about it, or it's bothering you, whatever. It's in there somewhere. This is a trigger. And it's a trigger which resonates with some of the conditioning that is, is part of your bag of tricks, of your karma, of your total conditioning. The way to, to rise above that when you're triggered is to say, to whom does this issue, this scenario, this anger about poisoning the earth, to whom does this arise? And the answer is always, in parenthesis, me. And the next question is, well, who am I? And as I said last week, this is allowing grace, which is love and action, to shine light on the false self, which is really shining light on the conditioning related to that particular question as it pertains to this me, which is the false self. So the trigger was triggering who you're not. And the light shines on that aspect of who you're not, and it, you said hiding in plain sight, withdraws back into the self. That's that tissue paper layer that I was talking to Sherry about. It's a layer of who you are not, which then dissolves back into the self from whence it, it began. That's how so-called conditioning dissolves. You're not doing the work. You're allowing the light that you are, which is grace, which is fully awake, to shine light on what you're not. That's how conditioning of itself withdraws back into the, the fire of truth, you could say, and dissolves. So you don't try to fix. You don't try to get rid of karma. You don't try to get rid of conditioning. You don't try to make your conditioning somehow better because no conditioning is better. It's like, you know, some... Love is, is uh, conditional, and that's okay. No, love has no conditioning whatsoever. Uh, the love that most people are aware of or think that they're aware of is not love at all. Uh, it's a pale imitation, and very often a pale, pale imitation, because loaded with conditioning and control, uh, one of the greatest control areas that exists uh, is in relationships, love, and sex. Um, so you cannot... Get rid of conditioning yourself. You can only allow the light to shine upon it so that it withdraws back into the self and, and dissolves that layer of it. And uh, hopefully, uh, Justin, that, that answers your question or, or uh, brings you closer to an understanding of it. So I'll just bring back Anne. Okay. Um, the next question is from Sarah Jane. And she says, would love to hear you talk more about feeling presence when in the company of someone who is in presence all the time, like you. 
You said this is actually our presence being felt. You said it was too complicated to go into now, uh, but it'd be great if you could talk about it at a later date. So I guess you talked to her before. Okay. Um, well, uh, when I said complicated, there's nothing complicated. Uh, complicated uh, meaning that it would have complicated uh, the show that we were on because I would have had to take about 10 minutes to, to go into that. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, the truth is not in any way, shape, or form complicated. Um, all evidence to the contrary, thousands and thousands, tens of maybe hundreds of thousands of spiritual books outside of religion, of which there are probably hundreds of thousands of books written on, you know, how to uh, return to God. Um, none of that is necessary uh, unless you resonate with it. And if it does, then that's where you're meant to be in the moment. Uh, but uh, the answer to this is very simple. You are God. Now, you can call God consciousness. You can call it I am. You can call it the self. Uh, you can call it uh, Brahman. Uh, there are Vishnu. Uh, there are many, many different names for God. However, this truth about who you really are, about you, is hidden behind this armor, these garments of conditioning. So... Presence is another name for God, is another name for the self. And when you, if you, come into contact with someone who is living in presence consciously uh, most of the clock time, let's put it that way, uh, it seems like their presence is something special that you, as someone who is not in presence, is appropriating from them or is receiving from them and that you are getting something in parenthesis out of this exposure to this presence that this individual is radiating. There's some truth to, to that explanation, but the reality is this, what you, the real you, which is me, uh, which is Anne, which is uh, uh, Sarah, uh, which is anybody on the show, the real truth is that we all are the self, not the body, not the identity, not the name you have on your license or your passport. We all are the self fragmented, you could say, through like light through a prism, coming out as all these different colors, but still just one. And in that moment that you are exposed to this individual who is seemingly in the light, self-realized, whatever you want to call it, you are open to the light that you are. So what you're really doing is you are opening your heart. You're saying yes to truth. You may not be consciously aware of it, but this acceptance of, perhaps you feel safe in this company, of this what looks to you like an individual, but is not, it's just an, a mirror for who you really are. Your openness is opening your heart to who you are and you are experiencing your true self. So it's not that person because it's not a person. It's simply the light that you have opened up to. Now this can happen in thousands of different ways, innumerable ways that your heart can open and, and you everyone here has experienced a heart opening um and and the feeling that it brings on of of divinity of of, of bliss in the moment it can be anything uh that makes you feel pure perfect uh blissful um uh, and i don't use the word happiness because that's a roller coaster with sorrow i use the word joy joy is another word for god for you for who you really are and in that moment, you are experiencing the real you, your presence. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, because it's really important to get that that when you are, you meaning anybody, is focused on um, becoming free, focused on truth, there is a tendency to look outside yourself at where you want to be, the mind 
which is the false identity, the false self identity, uh, it's always looking at goals, and targets. If you do that, you are acknowledging softly, but very powerfully that you're not already the thing that you're seeking. And this is separation, this keeps you from the very thing that you quote unquote want or that you wish to become aware of. When you are speaking about truth, one of the, I'll call it the quickest ways to bring yourself to the awareness of truth is to acknowledge that you are already truth. Now, the mind is going to tell you you're full of it, uh, and it will attack you in many, many different ways to say this is rubbish, you know, this is blasphemy, this is arrogance. No, it's not. It's simply stating the truth. And the more you acknowledge the fact that I am truth, I am that I am, uh, you are the self, the more you acknowledge that without ballyhooing it, without making yourself a big deal, certainly without making yourself special because you're not, uh, and yet you are. Um, you're the only special thing there is. But then if there's only one, then there's no such thing as special because there's no hierarchy. Uh, but when you acknowledge that this is who you are, you eliminate time and space. You eliminate this idea that I'm here now and I want to get there. And what happens is the there dissolves into what you hear about all the time, now. Now is not a time on the clock. Now is who you are. That's presence. Uh, this is not that well understood, uh, but that's the truth. Nowness is presence. And it's a, uh, an experience of the self that you are. So hopefully that helps. Nowness is not a ness. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a now. Yeah, a lot right? of ness doesn't exist. Yeah, right. Um, we have one more question that was submitted ahead of time. Uh, this is from Anonymous. We all know him. Yes, her. Uh, him and her. <laughs> yeah. uh, they want feedback. Uh, it's a suggestion feedback that we need to know who we are not. Yeah. Okay. This is this is really a uh, a super question. And and it's okay to pursue the truth, the self, through those ways and means. Um, I have a small handbook called self-discovery slash in inquiry. Uh, I've, I've already gone over self-inquiry and I'll probably go over it many times again. And I like to, I like to add uh, self-inquiry slash surrender. It's the other side of the coin. And the better to have self-inquiry plus surrender. But for those that are heavily in the mind, and uh, this is not a denigration of, of where you're at or places you on, on some rung in the ladder. It's just that's where you are in the moment. Self-discovery can be a, a segue, a stepping stone to bring you to the, the much, much easier um, uh, practice, we'll call it, of self-inquiry that um, I went into a little detail on. Self-discovery works like this. Uh, and, and, and to get back to the question, who you're not. Uh, when you are, as I said before, triggered by something, whatever it is, uh, that um, disturbs you, and it could be a huge disturbance or it could be a, a minor one, but you become aware of the fact that you're triggered. Uh, for example, uh, there's some sort of road rage going on. Somebody cuts you off and you become angry, uh, perhaps you're in a rage um, uh, towards this person that, you know, your windows are up and, and uh, they're now dr they've driven ahead and you, you, you're screaming at a car that's driving away. Um, this is not an unusual scenario uh, for some people. So then you, you sort of shrug your shoulders and you say, oh, my God, uh, especially if you're aware and you're looking for these things, uh, you've just been triggered by some rage. Now, here's how self-discovery works. You don't look, and, and ideally you're not doing this while you're driving. You, you take a moment later to do this, a um, uh, quiet moment uh, ideally. Self-inquiry can be done in the moment anywhere. Self-discovery is better done quietly, uh, ideally alone, but in, or in the presence of someone that 
that might be of, of some genuine assistance. Um, you, first of all, look at the rage as it pertains to the story. And what was the story? The story was you were cut off by somebody. doesn't matter who was right or wrong. If there was, because really there is no such thing as right or wrong. Um, you look at the story, the drama, and then you sink beneath the story because always there's going to be judgment related to the story. And the judgment's going to distract you from your objective, which is discover to discover who you're not. So you sink beneath it to how it makes you feel. And so let's say the feeling is rage, but it's rage without a definition. It's just raw rage, not rage because of XYZ story, drama. It's just rage. When you sink beneath that into the, call it the ephemeral energy of, in this case, rage, it could be anything, could be judgment, could be jealousy, could be hatred, could be fear, um, anxiety. There's thousands and thousands of different um, uh, ethereal feelings related to the drama story taking place on the stage by the actor called you. What you're doing is separating this you from the story by looking at the energy that was exuded from the moment, in this case, rage. And you allow yourself to sit in that feeling for as long as it takes for the feeling to subside. And what's happening, once again, is you are handing it over, you're handing this rage, this feeling over to grace, which is love and action, that then dissolves that conditioning, that aspect of who you are not back into the true self. It dissolves the cloud that's hiding the sun. Uh, you can look at this very obviously as it's, it's, it's um, more time intensive, uh, more labor intensive, you could say, to, to do this, uh, especially if there are many things that occur during the day and you're going through each one and, and re-feeling that scenario and that feeling and and allowing it to subside however long that takes again. But this is a, it, it's like a kind of a feeling of doing something. You're not the doer, uh, the self is, um, which is really not doing because nothing's happening. But, but let's just say the self or love in action in this case, um, grace is doing the doing. You're not, you're allowing it to happen. Um, but there's a feeling of control. There's a feeling of doing something that the mind gravitates to with some individuals, so-called individuals. And so self-discovery can be a stepping stone to segue into self-inquiry, which is lightning fast by comparison to self-discovery. But it's a very, very uh, fast, uh, relatively speaking, fast way of dissolving conditioning, uh, and remember, you're not doing the dissolving graces, um, compared to um, the thousands of hours, even hundreds of lifetimes uh, that many uh, take to, to come to the moment when they cross the bridge into freedom. And as Rumi said, you know, I'm knocking on the door and uh, the door opens and I realize I've been knocking from the inside. Um, when you realize you, you never went anywhere, you just thought you did. So hopefully that uh, that gives a little explanation of, of uh, how uh, dissolving what who you are not works if you choose to do it that way. Well, I have a question based on the answer to that question. May I ask it? Uh, well, you can ask anything you want. Thank you. Um, so you used examples of strong negative emotions like fear or frustration or anger, whatever, um, to prompt you into this process of self-discovery. Does the negative emotion provide the contrast to the love that you are to get your attention? Or why did you use examples of only 
negative emotions because is it because we are the love that's seeking ourself? Um, can you yeah. do you know that do you know what I'm asking? I, I definitely know what you're asking. Uh, let's just very quickly. Uh, we're at about uh, 50 minutes now. Very quickly, just touch on on this concept of negative and positive, which is a huge belief system that the, it's much better to be a positive, uh, have a positive mental attitude. Uh, and many, many famous people have written books about this and made you know tens of millions of dollars promoting it around the world. I was one of them, uh, but it's rubbish. Uh, there, there is nothing less true uh, in the dream than the, this concept of, of positive and negative being good or bad. Uh, Light, truth, even before light is the self, uh, is both positive and negative, uh, divine feminine, divine masculine. Um, uh, you cannot have one without, without the other. Uh, but negative is looked at as something dark and terrible and awful and something to you know not, not be. So if we can just for the moment put that on the shelf uh, as a, as a non-reality, uh, positive and negative, and just talk about what is – or what happened uh, that seems to gain the attention of uh, the so-called individual uh, being or having the appearance of being negative uh, and have the appearance of being an emotion. The, the person lying on the, on the beach, um, uh, wealthy, free of all troubles and everything, it's very easy to be a nice guy or a nice girl. <laughs> if you're if you're struggling and you're a workaholic and you're you're burning the midnight oil, uh, you can you can be pretty grumpy. Um, these things are not real, and so we tend to learn and and I call this the divine discontent that is the thorn in the side that the self created. You could say in order to bring itself out of the dream uh, had to be something that would get your attention. No. And so pain, which becomes suffering, is what gets the attention, or if you like, triggers you, meaning anybody, far greater than something that, you know, smells like a rose. Mm -hmm. And um, if we can just look at this concept of suffering, suffering is the direct result of believing in victimhood. And victimhood is a belief that comes about as a result of the belief in separation. Mm -hmm. So separation means there is a hierarchy. There's some haves and there's have nots. And so therefore some get it and some don't get it. Some suffer and some don't suffer. Suffering dissolves when the belief in separation dissolves. And the belief in separation dissolves because of the separation that brought you to, let's say, to your knees, meaning anybody, brought you to your knees so that you would go within and realize that it's not real. Mm -hmm. So something that's not real brought you to the point where you looked at the fact that it's not real. No. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it seems uh, crazy, but it's the, the brilliance of the, of the self capital letters, uh, bringing itself out of the delusion of not being itself through suffering. So virtually everybody finds their way to their knees through suffering. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. suffering is actually an ally. It's a blessing, an enormous blessing, yeah. without mm -hmm. which we'd be stuck in the dream. Yeah. It's such an interesting, yeah, I knew it? you were going to say that. I yeah. just knew it. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so cool. I think we're at the end of we're our about, time together. Before we leave and say goodbye, I just want to remind people that um, you can email John. If you can pop your email back up. Uh, he loves to get email, inundate his box with email for comments for questions that we can use in future episodes. If you guys are enjoying this, let us know. Um, and also if you have any suggestions about the platform or the format, or you need to get rid of that moderator. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, You're no. Fired. no, 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 <laughs> no, well, it could happen. I don't know. Um, so 
just, just, you know, let us know who you are and what's up. And uh, if you want to come on camera on, on the next quote unquote show, uh, you'd be welcome to, and you don't have to, but you know, you're invited. Probably you, next Thursday. Yeah. Same time, same station kind of thing. So John, do you have any closing comments before no, we I say just, goodbye? Uh, very grateful for those that uh, showed up. Uh, we hope that this is of some value. Uh, we're, we're very uh, um, uh, open to receiving uh, any comments that you have about it. And we hope to, uh, to have you uh, join us uh, next Thursday. We're going to continue this indefinitely um, uh, until it either goes another way or, uh, or, uh, or ceases, uh, if, if, uh, if that's the way it's supposed to be. We don't know. We're just uh, taking it a step at a time, living in the moment. And for now, uh, it'll be Thursdays at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time or wherever it happens to be in the world with you. So yeah. thank you so much for being with us. Bye now. <laughs> Bye for now. Lots of love. <laughs>